I didn't read the job title properly. I wasn't sure what exact qualifications you need to make ice cream. I didn't think it was much. I mean, it was just scooping frozen dessert and working the cash register, right? It's not like working with coffee or you have to memorize certain flavors. The most you needed was basic math skills and common sense. These days, businesses can get away with expecting 20 years of experience from a teenager and demanding degree-level qualifications in basic customer service. I was ready to be thoroughly grilled on any previous work experience I had, which was zero until now I had been putting 100% into my studies. I wasn't expecting the interviewer to ignore my school qualifications and the current degree I was studying, instead focusing on the part of my resume I spent the least amount of time on. The manager was in his mid to late forties, with a too wide grin and eyes I swore did not blink. Leaning over his MacBook with his hands steepled, he fixed me with a smile. The guy's office was a claustrophobic nightmare, a tiny room stuffed in the back of Moo Moo Brain Desserts, with a simple desk and leather chair. The place did not look appealing in the slightest, with peeling paint on the walls and paperwork strewn across the floor, but I just nodded and smiled and politely declined the coffee he offered me in a stained coffee cup. I was yet to meet my colleagues. I did see people working up fronts when I walked in, but they didn't even look at me. He says here you were on a track team. He prodded my resume in front of him. Why don't you tell me more about that? Track? I found myself repeating in a disbelieving laugh. Wait, really? The man didn't look amused. I did say that, didn't I? He stabbed at my resume, specifically the bottom section where I had added my hobbies. I put down reading, writing, and running. I did track in my junior and senior years of high school. It started out as a hobby and a distraction from my studies, and I quickly realized I could run. I could actually run long distances and win races. I joined track and field, and then competitions. The buzz from the adrenaline of the race was insane. Running was a drug, and I craved it. I still dream of the initial moments pre-race before the crack of the gunshot, which set my mind into a frenzy. I'm leaning forward with my hands pressed into the asphalt, sweat dripping down my back and soaking my shirt, the sole of my shoe teasing the pedal. It was those seconds right before which sent my thoughts into a blur. I didn't have to think about SATs or college, hearing my own shaky breaths trying to calm myself down, but also reveling in the inability to breathe, to catch my breath. I could just throw myself into a sprint and I wouldn't have to think. With an audience, it was even better. I'm not saying I was good enough to get gold or silver, but bronze was mine in the latter half of my senior year. I started running to get outside and away from the pressure of schoolwork and being a teenager in general, and I continued it because it was mine. It was my own personal heaven, my therapeutic safe haven, where I could just run with the wind in my hair in all seasons, in blustery wind and ice-cold rain and the sweltering sun. I even ran in the snow. It was perfect. I had fond memories of my friends on the track team cheering me on and sitting on the sidelines screaming their names until my throat was raw, waving my arms like I was crazy. When I started college, I was no longer in the middle of nowhere in my tiny town or I could run pretty much anywhere. In the city, it's different. Sure, I could go for a morning run, but it's not the same as home. The air is too thick and polluted in the morning, so I have to head to the park, which is almost an hour's run from my dorm. So, after several attempts at the start of the semester, I gave up on running and went back to hyper-focusing on my schoolwork. Oh. I didn't mean to sound confused, but my tone definitely suggested I was baffled by the manager's request. Well, uh, as it says, I did track in high school for a hobby... He hummed. Fascinating. Don't you say you're a good runner? He peered at my resume for my name, clearing his throat. Addy. I nodded. 
According to every article I had read on job interviews, I had to retain a jaw-aching grin. Apparently, I couldn't slump in my seat or wrinkle my nose. All of those were turn-offs. This guy was already kind of a creep, drinking me in from head to toe. And not just that. It was almost like he was looking directly into my brain, invading my thoughts. His eyes were a funny blue color, piercing and cutting like a blade. A dull pain thrummed across the back of my skull, and my words tangled on my tongue. I didn't know what it was about this guy. I couldn't speak, couldn't think properly. Like he had cracked open my skull with a simple stare. The suit and neat haircut just alleviated his creepiness. It didn't make sense why he was so obsessed with my failed track career, but I wasn't giving up. I had heard of certain employers intentionally throwing an interview to get rid of an interviewee. I caught a quirk on his lip, almost like he could sense, but no, hear what I was thinking. I tried not to make eye contact, focusing on the grains on the wooden table. Yes, I said. I was one of the best on my team. I can run long distances. How far? I'm sorry? How far can you run? Um... I was all too aware my mind had gone completely blank. That question caught me out. He must have seen my expression because he changed the subject. Have you won any awards? I won bronze. No gold or silver. We need people who can run fast and have a good stamina. He cleared his throat. You seem confused. I maintained that wide smile, though it was faltering a little. I thought I was serving ice cream. Addy, what is the job title? I was under the impression it was just serving dessert. I didn't bother looking at the title, but the description was good enough for me. When I uncomfortably pressed myself against the desk to lean over, following the man's gaze, I realized I had been mistaken. It says, Runner, I whispered. I peered at the rest of the job description because it had definitely been edited, but he placed a cup of coffee over the paperwork. I could just about make out, grueling and hard work hours, must be prepared to deal with violence slash unexplainable phenomena, when he rudely cleared his throat for what must have been the third or fourth time. This guy was clearly used to treating his employees terribly, and if I wasn't in the worst financial situation, which was pretty much get a job or starve, I would have stuck my nose up at him and strode out without a word. Unfortunately, I couldn't live on noodles for the rest of my life. So, I had to suck in my pride and smile at this clown. Yes, he spoke in a patronizing tone that made me want to punch him in the face. I'm going to ask again. His smile widened. Do you think you're a good runner? As you have probably realized, you will not be serving ice cream. Or you will, but those will not be your primary duties. Instead, you'll be bringing in certain customers who have not been. The skin wrinkled around his mouth when he frowned, pausing for a moment. Paying for their products, he continued. We did have a runner, though. She quit under circumstances that are not our business. Whoever's on shift will drive you to their home. He prodded his desk with his index. Most of our customers reside within a college dorm, so you don't have to worry about locations. All you have to do is inform them that they are in debt and bring them in. The manager folded his arms. Most of them are your age, so manhandling them will not be difficult. If you have to use violence, please only do so in self-defense. He stood up from his chair, and I followed him, my head kind of foggy. I was still trying to register his words. Was this guy expecting me to be some kind of ice cream bailiff? Had he even looked at me? I was five foot nothing with a face that still got me ID'd despite being almost 24 years old. I kept waiting for him to burst out laughing and then go over my actual duties, but he just fumbled around in a drawer underneath his desk and pulled out a baseball cap 
handing it over. Your job is runner, so yes, our customers tend to be a slight problem. You are expected to pursue them and deposit them into the van where your colleague on shift will be waiting for you. They should come willingly. If they don't, you may use force. So, kidnapping light. Is this legal? I didn't mean to speak out loud, expecting to be chastised for questioning the rules, though the man surprised me with a laugh. Funnily enough, no, we are not breaking the law. As long as you're not hurting customers and gently escorting them to us, they should be fine. It's all in good fun. He nodded for me to try my hat, and I did, cringing at the feeling of the material scraping over my ears. It was way too small, and I knew it was going to give me headaches. Once brought in, our customers are encouraged to make a payment plan with us to avoid any more problems. Our establishment's very different from others. Instead of payment on the day, our customers are given a 24-hour guarantee and can return their dessert if they are unsatisfied. And if everything is okay, they pay and arrange a new order. Wrinkling his nose, the manager's smile curled into a scowl. Which is, of course, taken advantage of by our younger customers. He rolled his eyes. And so, the running job was born. I got sick of chasing college students around the city for cash and managed to come up with a completely legal, if not slightly immoral way, to play them at their own game. With the guy grinning like a cartoon villain, I was starting to wonder if eating noodles every night for dinner wouldn't be such a bad idea. What a backwards and pretentious way to run a business. You don't have to pay now, but I'm trusting you not to be an asshole. Sure, I didn't have to agree with stealing, and these kids were probably in the wrong somewhere. However, he was kind of asking for it with that kind of payment method. It still didn't make sense. Did this guy take personal information upon serving these kids? How exactly did he know where they lived? And why were they all in the same location? But then he slapped my first advanced payment in front of me. Four hundred dollars in cash. I stopped asking questions, both mentally and verbally. Okay, so I would like to preface this by saying I was broke, and my new boss was offering me 400 bucks to play Ice Cream Bailiff. I wasn't thinking straight. That's how I ended up signing a brow-raising contract. I didn't see anything wrong with it until the very last page. Moo Moo Brain Ice Cream is not responsible for bodily harm and injury following the use of certain phenomena caused by our customers. It is your responsibility to protect yourself from harm. Well, that was ominous. I pointed out the claws, only for my boss to shrug it off. Sometimes our customers can get violent and offensive, but the worst we have had is a broken ankle. Still, though... The guy was reluctant to explain what phenomena it was talking about. He was practically breathing in my ear when I signed the contract, making sure to take several photos of it when he was fumbling around for a work uniform. To protect myself, I made sure not to use my legal second name and made up one on the spot. Addie Smith. I could only manage a nod when he shoved a navy blue uniform in my arms. Congratulations, Addy. The manager, who introduced himself as Clayton, gave me a half-hearted salute. You are now a member of Moo Moo Brain Ice Cream. He collapsed into his chair with a sigh. Your shift starts in... He lifted his head and peered at the clock above the door. Six minutes. Feel free to change into your uniform, and your colleague will be waiting for you outside. I was halfway to the door when he stopped me, his fingers wrapping around my elbow. Aren't you forgetting something? The cash. I won't describe the humility of nodding with a forced smile and swiping up the 400 bucks in front of his smug face. He knew I needed it, and he fucking knew I would sign that contract if there was money in front of me. I had half a mind to throw it in his face, but I also needed it. So, 
Pocketing the cash, I headed to the girls' restroom and changed quickly, throwing on the uniform. The shirt fit pretty well. I was trying to fit the stupid hat over my head when the door to the girls' restroom flew open. A dark-haired girl rushed in, pounding into a stall, and slammed it shut behind her. I only got a glimpse of her, but it was just enough to make out a basic facial structure. Dark blonde hair tied into a ponytail and freckled cheeks. I heard her sobs, her knees hitting the ground, followed by the sounds of violent retching. I wanted to ask her if she was okay, but every time I opened my mouth, the girl heaved and started choking again. The lights flickered above, and something ice cold crept down my spine when there was no answer. Only the sounds of violent retching reverberating off of the walls. Finally, I managed to coerce words. Hey, are you okay? I paused. Do you need anything? The lights finally stabilized, and I let out a breath. The girl shoved the stall door open and reappeared with a wide beam, swiping at her teary eyes. Nope. She stepped in front of the mirror and splashed water on her face, before turning to me. There was something splattered on the front of her apron. I noticed a smear of it on her collar, but then I was seeing it on the cuffs of her sleeve, and when I looked closer, staining her palms. When she caught my eye, her smile widened. You're the new girl, right? The girl dug into her jeans and pulled out mascara, reapplying it with shaky hands. The girl was visibly trembling, and yet had thrown up a barrier with a flick of her ponytail sticking from her cap. I didn't think our manager would look for a new runner so soon. She side-eyed me, straightening up with her hands planted on her hips, like she hadn't been violently vomiting several minutes earlier. Before I could speak, the girl held out her hands for me to shake. Now that she was closer to me, I realized how beautiful, almost unnaturally beautiful she was. While her hair resembled liquid gold, her skin was flawless, freckles gathering on pinkish cheeks on a heart-shaped face. The girl was somehow glowing, despite sparfing up her insides. She didn't make sense. Perfection resembling a human being, not a hair out of place. Everything I wanted to be and more, and yet I didn't feel envious of her. Instead, my colleague's lack of flaws freaked me out. I couldn't resist my gaze flicking back to the state of her apron, and she followed my gaze, twisting back to face the mirror. It's strawberry syrup, she said with a breathy laugh. I'm Violet, by the way. Addie, I said. Are you sick? I heard you, um, hmm? She looked confused, her eyes flickering, seemingly reshaping the words on her lips, which looked like, are you kidding me? The girl was definitely going to say something else before realizing I was the new girl, and a stranger. Oh, I just get a bad reaction sometimes. I'm used to it by now. Oh, right. Violet lazily cocked her head to the side. I wonder how long you'll last, Daddy. You think I'm not going to last? She shrugged, grabbing her bag from the stall and digging around inside. I wasn't expecting her to pull out what looked like a chocolate milkshake. Violet sipped from the straw, and I noticed her facial expression relax. The lights above stopped flickering erratically, and she finally fixed me with a smile. I was a runner on my first day, she mumbled through the straw. I quit after two customers, but I already knew this place's deal, so it didn't really matter to me. Clayton and I were aligned back in my freshman year, and let's say I wasn't... Her eyes glinted, tapping her manicure on the white marble faucet. Turned off. Violet shrugged. I just really don't like chasing after them, you know? I thought it was cool at first. That, like I could straight up tell strangers that they were coming with me and they had no choice. But then, well, they started running. And I knew it was my job to chase them, but it's, like, so annoying when I'm clearly slower than them, and they have uh, such a bigger advantage, which is stupid. I could have sworn the girl's speech was slowing down into an almost slur, like she was drunk. When her mouth split into a dazed grin, I wondered if it was the shake. And now, with you, I'm confused. 
She jumped in front of me with a spring in her step, her ponytail bobbing up and down. With the straw still poking from her mouth, she surveyed me. You don't look like a runner. Violet slurped more of her shake with a head tilt, and with every sip, her body seemed more alive, animated, like she was sipping on liquid drugs. Even her pupils were dilated. No offense, but you don't look like you chase misbehaving college brats. You have to actually run after these guys, and believe me when I tell you that they are fast. Like, super fast. She giggled, drinking her shake. But I'm not gonna judge. Her lips curled into a smirk. If you can capture your first buggy without Dylan's help, I'll happily welcome you to the family. She turned her head like she had heard her name, though it was just the two of us. It was bizarre, the way the girl's expression twitched, her lips mouthing silent words like she was talking to herself. She headed to the door before shooting me one last look. Good luck, newbie. I noticed her swipe at her apron for way too long, swiping and swiping and swiping, like she was clawing at it, desperate to get her filthy hands clean before disappearing through the door. I noticed she left the empty shake, and I was suddenly intrigued what exactly was in that thing. Clearly, she was hyped up on something. So what was it? The girl was freaking out beforehand, barfing into the toilet, so what was in the shake that had put her in that state? I was reaching out to pick it up when Violet poked her head through the door. Dylan's waiting for you. She winked at me, before darting away, her voice echoing behind her. I read your buggy's file, and oh man, he's a slippery one. Buggies were what they referred to customers as. I met my second colleague outside. When I stepped out into the cool night air, a guy in his early twenties was leaning against a pastel pink van with Moo Moo Desserts, You Will Keep Coming Back, pasted on the front. The guy wasn't on the phone. Initially, I thought he was talking to the manager. The doors of the van were open, so... Maybe someone was in there. I could only see his face in the dim. But when I got closer, I realized there was nobody there. I could see his hands were empty, his jaw set, eyes drinking in nothing. The guy was talking out loud, having a full-blown conversation with himself. Nah, cause I'm the one who looks crazy. His eyes wrinkled. How many people do you think- He cleared his throat. No, I can see that, but it didn't give you an excuse to act like that. When I'm working, too, it's given the store a bad rep. I peered at him, looking for a Bluetooth device stuck to his ear, but there was nothing. Before he could continue, I awkwardly introduced myself, and he twisted around, lips curving into a frown. The guy's face was illuminated in headlights bleeding into the dim, dark, blonde hair sticking from the company hat, which was a little too big for his head. The uniform suited him well. A collared polo shirt under a Sherpa jacket. He reminded me of an old boyfriend. The perfect amount of stubble on his chin. I wondered if he was mainly at the counter serving customers, for obvious reasons. How long does it take you to change into your uniform? Before I could respond, he dived into the front seat and gestured for me to get in. I did after hesitating. When I was buckled in, I noticed a half-empty milkshake hanging out of a drinks holder. It was identical to the one Violet had been drinking from. The guy downed the whole thing before starting up the van and shooting me a smile, cream fraying on his lip. Like my other colleague, his personality had seemingly changed erratically after drinking that mysterious milkshake. I'm Dylan. Nice to meet you. He fumbled in the glove compartment and pulled out a battered file, throwing it on my lap. Read through this. His eyes grazed the road as he drove. Our buggy's 19, male. He owes us 400 bucks. And ice cream? I questioned, my gaze flicking over the customer's details. I didn't realize Dylan was still draining the empty milkshake, chewing on the straw as he drove. These people really liked their shakes. I was curious if our manager was loading them with caffeine, or at some secret recipe to make them addictive. Part of me wanted to ask for one myself if they acted like an energy drink. Yeah, he's one of our notorious ones. We we'll even sent out a runner until now since we've... you know. He pulled a face. 
I guess we've been given him the benefit of the doubt with his... He trailed off for a moment, his expression darkening. It was a blink and you'll miss its moments before he seems to snap out of it. But I caught it. I caught his lip mouthing the words, or at least starting to mouth them, before he caught my eye. It felt like there was someone else in there with us, with the way my colleague's expression kept twitching. His body angled like he was ready to turn to the back. His... his situation... Dylan finished, nodding to the folder. Most of our younger buggies are at that address, so we're pretty popular with college kids. When my colleague leaned forward to crank up the radio, singing along to a catchy commercial, I focused on the file. Nathaniel Mycroft, sex, male, education, late in high school, MIT, currently. Blood type, A negative. Family, N.A. Address. This guy had no family, was smart enough to get into MIT, and had spent about $500 on frozen dessert. My gaze kept being drawn back to blood type. Why would an ice cream store have these kinds of details? His medical history. Did they really need that? Instead of asking questions, I turned to the driver. How did you end up working here? I don't know where that came from. I guess I was nervous. His expression twisted. Me and my professor go way back, he murmured. I was actually one of his first customers, if you can believe that. I frowned, watching traffic go by in a colorful blur. Professor? Dylan nodded, sucking on the dry milkshake straw. Hmm, let's just say he let me see the light. We made a deal a few years ago when he started this business... I stayed with him and worked for his store, and I can stay with my... Dylan's lips twitched, his fingers turning white around the wheel. Friend. Does your friend work here? I asked, and he surprised me with a sputtered laugh, though his smile was suddenly incredibly sad. The guy leaned back in his seat with a sigh, his tongue coming out to lap up excess cream on the corner of his lips. You could say that. Dylan didn't speak after that. Well, he did, but it was to himself. The guy tried to hide it with the radio, but his lips were definitely moving like he was talking to someone who wasn't me. I kept glancing in the back to see if there was another colleague I hadn't noticed, and there was no one there. This guy was freaking me out. Was he seeing things I wasn't? Thankfully, the journey didn't last too long. When Dylan pulled up outside towering metal gates, I was itching to jump out, away from his incoherent muttering. Here we are. He pushed the door open for me. Grand Courthouse. Dylan gestured past the gate. Your buggy is on the second floor. Just ask a receptionist to let you through. When I jumped out and grabbed my jackets, pulling it on, he passed me a walkie-talkie. I'll be here vibing to music and definitely not getting high, so radio me if you need me, alright? I can take care of the buggy once he's stepped over the threshold. Runners lure him outside, and I grab him. So, I just... go and get him? Dylan tipped his head back with a sigh, his eyes flickering shut. Yeah, that's usually how it goes. As always, be careful, and please don't let him get away. He lazily pointed to the glove compartment. I'd tie my hair up if I were you. Our last runner got yanked back by your ponytail and thrown down the stairs. The boy sent me a sickly smile. It was her fault, though. She wasn't our best. Way too empathetic. Buggies had her wrapped around their little finger. He threw me a hair tie. Still, though, she was nice. Alyssa. I still visit her in the hospital when I'm off shift. I must have looked horrified, because his lips split into a grin. Dude, I'm kidding. Lisa just got a new job. He winked at me. Or did she? This guy was the job equivalent of the teacher who told the class about the kid who swung backwards on their chair too far and cracked open their skull. Dylan was joking around, and yet his eyes, when I really looked at them, were hollow. His smile, fake. I had half a mind to quit right there, but I needed the cash. Besides, it was just escorting people into a van. 
If they were violent, I knew just enough self-defense to avoid getting hurt, and I could run. All I could do was nod and tie my hair up, tucking it under my cap. I left Dylan, who started talking to himself again, like I wasn't even there, and pushed my way through the gate. The van stayed parked right outside, so all I had to do was lure the buggy out. Dylan told me the minute the buggy was outside the gates, he would take care of him. I wasn't sure what that meant, and the guy didn't exactly look like the type of guy who would take care of anyone. Grand Courthouse reminded me of a dorm room. I think that is what it was. Apparently, the kids who couldn't afford actual student dorms were all shoved into this place. When I started up the path, however, I found myself looking up at barred windows. The building itself was ancient, crumbling brick with ivy crawling up the door. I knocked before a small voice shouted, Come in. And I found myself in a more modern-looking reception area. The inside was drastically different from the outside. Inside, a warm, glowing light greeted me, air conditioning blasting me in the face. There was an oldish woman sitting behind a laptop. When her eyes found me, her smile seemed to falter. You must be the new runner. She spoke in disgust. I nodded with what I hoped was a smile. In the corner of my eye, through automatic doors leading into what looked like a downstairs lounge, two college guys had caught my attention. Not because of what they were doing, which was watching a video on one of their phones. No. It was because they were both hovering almost two feet from the ground. I don't know how I maintained my smile, giving my details to the scowling receptionist who suddenly decided she hated me. When she was typing on her laptop, I risked a glance at the guys to see if I was imagining things. Nope. They were definitely hovering. I thought it was a trick at first, but then the second guy uncrossed his dangling legs and my heart dove into my throat. This guy was flying. I'm not talking superheroes swooping across the sky like in comic books and movies. He was just... dangling. Like a puppet on strings. But there were no strings. There was no logical explanation for why this guy and his friend could fly. Fourth floor on the right. The receptionist's voice cut into my thoughts and I turned back to her narrowed eyes. She gestured to the door, her cheeks visibly paling. Enjoy. Her tone suggested otherwise. So, with no other option, I headed through the doors, following the woman's instructions. The dorm rooms were strangely quiet for 10 p.m. The further I delved into this place, it reminded me less of a college dorm and more of an orphanage. I walked past a student lounge with multiple mounted televisions playing YouTube videos, groups of kids hanging around playing video games or sitting individually with their heads buried in books. The place was cozy. There were ancient chandeliers hanging from every room, a mix of old and modern decor. Next to the lounge was the dining area where a group of girls were talking. The doors were open, my presence drawing their attention. They had the same reaction as the receptionist, eyeing me like I had a contagious disease before whispering to each other. I met my buggy halfway up the stairs towards the fourth floor. Testing, testing. Dylan's voice came out in a scream of static. Have you got him? Dylan's voice crackled from the walkie, and I was about to reply, not yet, before running footsteps sounded from above. I could hear the slap of Converse against the marble staircase. Oh, fuck. The footsteps came to an abrupt stop, and I found myself face to face with a wide-eyed guy who was half-dressed, with a jacket over what looked like pajamas, and a backpack hanging off his right shoulder, inky black hair slipping from his hood. The guy looked like he'd just gotten out of bed, half-lidded eyes zeroing in on me. I was speaking before I could stop myself. The words tangled on my tongue. Nathaniel Mycroft? I tried to appear friendly, but this guy wasn't buying it. His lips curling. He took a step back before seemingly rethinking his tactic. His eyes darted for escape. I got ready to run, my breath hitching. 
Uh, hello, uh, my name is Addy. I'm from Mumu Brain Desserts, and you owe us. I don't care. He spat. I know what you're doing, and you're not taking me. His expression crumpled. You're new, right? Listen to me very carefully. I don't owe them shit. These guys have been hunting me down for a while with no good reason. He choked out a laugh. Trust me, I'm the real victim here. I've never even ordered from this place, and I'm the fifth student they've come for. He folded his arms. I don't know why you're taking us, but I'm not fucking stupid. I know what goes on around here. I waved the receipt with his last 14 orders. Your last order was double chocolate chip fudge brownie cheesecake with s'mores and a coke. I said. That came out to $23.89. His lips curled. That's not me. You've got the wrong guy. He held up his arms in mock surrender. I can't wait for your excuse this time. After you took Alex and Lily, I thought you were done. From the almost animalistic gleam in his eye, this guy knew more than he was letting on. I peered at the file still clenched in my clammy hands. You owe four hundred dollars. I cleared my throat, relaying the speech I had to learn on short notice. If you could come with me quickly and quietly, we won't have to enforce jail time. You'll be encouraged to set up a payment plan. The words croaked into the back of my throat when the guy, completely ignoring me, shoved past me and dived onto the stair railing, toes primed on the edge. Oh, God. Something sour filled my mouth. He was going to jump. The drop would kill him for sure, or at least break his back. Before I could grab him and pull him off of the railing, the boy jumped. It went so fast I could barely register it. The guy was in front of me one minute, and the next, he was diving off the edge. I screamed, stumbling back. I wanted to look away, but something kept my eyes glued to the boy. As he hit the ground, not with a meaty smack bleeding out across black and white tiles, Nathaniel Mycroft landed on his toes like a cat. Before I could fully register what the fuck I was looking at, he catapulted into a run, pushing through the doors in a whirlwind. Dylan and Violet were right. He was fast. Daddy. Dylan's impatient voice came through the talkie, and I remembered how to breathe. What's taking you so long? Did the buggy slip away from you? He just jumped, I whispered, peering over the rail. He jumped from the fourth floor. Oh yeah, they tend to do that. I'd go after him if I were you. His tone hardened. If you lose this buggy, we're screwed. And that's both of us. I don't know if it was my colleague's voice that snapped me out of it, my body throwing me into a sprint down the stairs. I hadn't run properly in a while, and that feeling came back in a rush, sucking in dry air, pumping my arms to push myself faster, throwing myself back through the doors and into the reception. The doors were open. I could just about glimpse a figure heading not towards the gate, which was where Dylan was waiting, but across the parking lot. There must have been another exit, and if the guy reached it, I was fired. God, running felt good. Even if I was chasing down college kids in debt, the shadow darting into the dark edged closer as I forced my legs further, my shoes scratching the asphalt. Nathaniel was slowing down, and I used that to my advantage. I was reaching out and grasping for the hood of his jacket to gently pull him back like I had been taught when he disappeared. I blinked. No, he reappeared several feet away, stumbling, tripping onto his hands and knees, and then using them to push himself into a sprint. I swore if I squinted, the night was filled with tiny specks of blue light as if the dark in front of me was being swallowed by the ocean. I must have been losing my mind. Then, though, he changed direction abruptly, like his body was in control of his brain. Nathaniel twisted around and took off towards me, sprinting past me and toward the gate, which was exactly what I wanted. It only took me chasing him toward the exit before Dylan appeared seemingly out of nowhere, greeting the guy with a scowl and folded arms. This time he was wearing Ray-Bans. He slipped them off, dark eyes drinking in the buggy. 
We got you, kid. So chill out, all right? Nathaniel suddenly looked terrified, almost feral. My jackets blew open. With no breeze, my hair caught in an invisible gust. He gritted his teeth like an animal and stumbled back with a whine, looking at me for help. But my colleague was quickly stepping in front of him before he could get away. I said, his tone was ice cold, and I saw my colleague's lips curve into a smile, which was almost greedy. I didn't realize he was bouncing on his toes like he was excited. We've got you. I don't know what impression Dylan had over the guy, but I saw it in the way the buggy seemed to give up, his arms dropping to his sides. My hair stopped whipping around my face, coming to a standstill. Nathaniel's eyes seemed to relax, his expression going slack. You got me. His voice drooped into a deadpan tone, oddly repeating my colleague's words. I will chill out. I sat with Nathaniel on the way back to the store, riding in the metal prison in the back of the van. The boy didn't speak for most of the ride, his head tipped back, eyes closed. I was slowly drifting off, when the boy's voice startled me, slicing through my thoughts. His sharp intake of breath had taken me off guard. This guy was seriously scared of Moo Moo brain desserts. They're going to kill me, he whispered. Forcing my eyes open, something cold creeping down my spine. The two of us were sitting opposite. Every time the van went over a speed bump, I had to stop myself from tipping over. I leaned forward, my gut jumping into my throat. What? The guy's eyes were sparkling with tears. You have to help me. He broke out into a sob, and it was too real for me to ignore. He was trembling his hands clenched in his lap. Please, you don't understand. At that place, he hissed out. They grow us. Grow you, I hissed out. What are you talking about? Grand Courthouse, he gritted through his teeth. It's a fucking farm. Hey, nay, Dylan shouted from the back, and Nathaniel's body jolted like he had been shocked. He jumped back, bringing his knees to his chest. Why don't you stop talking shit, all right? You got caught, that's it. Stop freaking out the runner girl. To my confusion, Nathaniel sat up straight, his gaze finding mine. I'm sorry for scaring you, he said. I got caught, and that's it. I didn't mean to freak out the runner girl. His lips spread into an unnerving grin. Dylan made a satisfied noise from the front, and neither of them spoke for the rest of the van ride. When we arrived back at the store, I was congratulated, and Nathaniel, who was still smiling, his eyes empty and vacant, were dragged into a back room with no complaint or struggle. The rest of the night, I was working on the register, serving customers. Mumu brain desserts had a certain demographic which surprised me. Middle-aged moms and dads ordering for their kids. But it was almost midnight. Weren't their kids asleep? I was ready to finish my shift when I realized Nathaniel was still in the back. It had been hours and I hadn't heard him come out. I was cleaning up when Violet appeared with a grin, situating herself in front of me. She handed me a strawberry milkshake. A deal's a deal. Welcome to the family. She handed me the shake and a rainbow straw. It's fresh. Just been made. She winked. I had the flavors to die for. I waited until I was packing up to drink it. So I left the shake in the refrigerator to take home. I was packing up cartons, idly sipping it. It was good. Holy shit. It was the best thing I had ever tasted. A mixture of tangy and sweet and a little bit of sour. I wasn't surprised these shakes sent my colleague crazy. I found myself dancing around the kitchen, sidestepping to the radio, until I glimpsed someone's notes on the counter in front of the register. At first glance, it seems like basic information. Looking closer, however, 
Strawberry slime inched its way back up my throat, filling my mouth. I felt my body tense up, and before what I was reading could fully register, my legs gave way. I found myself staring at names. Above me, the lights flashed on and then off. The spatula I was using to scoop ice cream flying off of the counter and slamming into the wall. Not just names. Expiry dates. Client names, too. Each order already paid for. All of them were already paid for. Alex Karsten. Fresh. Just removed. Psycat 5. For Miss Jefferson. Address. Lily Carlisle. Fresh. Just removed. Psycat 3. For Miss Holmes. Address. Becca East. 07 14 20 23. Psycat 5. For Eleanor Jacobs. Notes. For a five-year-old, so easy on the whipped cream and sprinkles. And at the bottom, written in gold. Nathaniel Mycroft, TBD, schedule removal, 07-20-2023.